a church board meeting next Sunday after worship. Are there any other announcements? I just want to tell you how good it is to see you again. We had a fantastic time away, but nothing beats coming back and seeing the faces of those that we love so much. So it's good to be back. Let us stand and turn our hearts and our minds to worship. Let's sing. And we give you thanks and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning. How are you all today? Good. I'm glad you're here. And Madison asked me why we only have one candle lit. And we have one candle lit this Sunday. And next Sunday we'll light another one. And the next Sunday we'll light another one. And we'll light another one. And the next time we'll light the candle will be Christmas Eve. So this is what we call Advent. We're hoping and we're waiting and we're anticipating the birth of a baby. What baby is it, Madison? Jesus! Madison, is it the baby Jesus? Yeah. Well, what's missing up front up here? Baby Jesus. Yes, but first, we're going to tell the story. Each week, I'm going to tell you a little bit different part of the story. And the story this week is about Mary and Joseph. Find Mary and Joseph? All right, 
Shall we take them up front? All right. Can Jameson carry one? Okay. Let's go put Mary and Joseph up in the front by the church tree. This week, our story is about Mary and Joseph, and they're getting ready for the baby to be born. So let's look. Is there a baby? No, it's not time yet. And it's going to be a long season for you guys. It's going to be a whole month, but it's called Advent. Today's the Sunday of hope, and we know that Jesus is coming, and he's the hope of the world. You've seen Jesus before? Well, good. I'm glad you have. And who loves us? Jesus! All right, let's play that music. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will fulfill the promise I made to the house of Israel and the house of Judah. In those days and at that time, I will cause a righteous branch to spring up for David, and he shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In those days, Judah will be saved and Jerusalem will live in safety. And this is the name by which it will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. These words of Jeremiah were spoken into a dire situation. The armies of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, are advancing on Jerusalem. They have them surrounded. The worst has not yet happened, but it's inevitable. Any reasonable person in Jerusalem can see that the city is doomed. Jeremiah's many prophecies of judgment that have landed him in prison are coming to be. And yet now, in the midst of this catastrophe, the prophet finally speaks words of promise. In the previous chapter, he has purchased a piece of land. Now, who in their right minds is going to go out and invest in real estate when foreign armies are advancing on you? Nobody's going to do that. Jeremiah did it intentionally as a sign of hope that that land would someday be redeemed. 
And then in this chapter, he is speaking hope again, that God says, I'm going to restore you. Jerusalem will again be my place. Of course, they're going to go into exile in Babylon first. And one of the chief tragedies of their exilic existence was the end of the dynasty of David. For nearly 400 years, descendants of David had sat on the throne in Jerusalem. And God had promised that it would always be so. But the Babylonians destroyed David's city, burned Solomon's temple, and took David's heirs into exile. The promises of God seemed to have come to an end. To a people devastated by loss, Jeremiah's prophecy offered some hope. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will fulfill the promise I made to the house of Israel and the house of Judah. All might seem lost, but God is still faithful. The house of David might be cut down, but God is able to bring life out of death. A branch will sprout. There will be new life. Now, there's plenty of bad news in our world, too. I mean, COVID and a new variant, this one worse than the first. Supply chain woes. Try ordering a new bicycle and getting parts for that or anything else. So you're going to be out of luck most of the time or at least have to wait for quite a while. A lot of people aren't working. It's hard to get service in a lot of places. And what is going on with the flash mob robberies? What is the deal with that? And there's so much anger. Everybody's so filled with anger. Gas prices are high. Groceries are getting outrageous. The list goes on. There's plenty of bad news if one wants to find such. Have you ever been around someone who focuses on bad news? It's hard to be around someone who does that. They don't have any joy in life. Everything has to fit into a framework of gloom and doom and bad news. Conversely, those who always find the good news have a different kind of energy about them. And there's plenty of good news if you're willing to see it. Or look for it. And being the science junkie that I am, I like to read about new advances. If you like good news when it comes to congenital diseases like Parkinson's and MS and things like that, there's a lot of reason to be hopeful. Also, Alzheimer's and dementia, which has affected and touched so many of us. There are huge strides in the understanding of how it happens and in potential treatments for that. And with quantum computing on the horizon, these computers powered by quantum computing can handle exponentially more data and variables that makes our computers today look like something out of the Stone Age. All of these things can bring about an end to these congenital diseases. For sure in 20 years, our lives are gonna look so much different than they are today. Not all of that may be good, but there's a lot of good that can come from that. And there's so much promise and hope. The hope for me in that is that there are smart people working on big problems and they can find something that we never dreamt possible. You're into crypto. I don't know exactly what it is, but I know it's a thing and it's securing futures for a lot of people. Crypto investment is a good thing, I think. People are giving, and this is the big one for me, where I really find hope. People are giving their time, talents, and money to ensure that others have what they need for the holidays and for a long and cold winter. 
Though the numbers of people attending worship are down, the hunger for spiritual depth and learning is stronger than it's been in a while. Church won't look the same down the road, but people are hungering for the depth of understanding that comes from living a faith-centered life. People want to hear what we have grown up with and what we've experienced here. And a branch will shoot up, as Jeremiah says, and it will bear the imprint of the Most Holy. The hope provided in Jeremiah's words brought hope to people in dire times. And though the kings descending from David wouldn't sit on a throne in Jerusalem again, there will be a descendant of David that will arise and bring hope to people then and still yet today. The Messiah, the Christ, the one we know as Jesus. The shoot coming from the branch isn't just one branch from one tree all those thousands of years ago. They are everywhere. Sometimes we miss them entirely. Sometimes we even forget to look for them. But there is hope all around us. And in central Illinois, we have a front row seat to the story of life and resurrection and new life right in front of us. This ground that it, you just finished harvesting and working, or finishing working, it tells the story of God and God's life and creation over and over and over again. Each season brings another chapter in our story of redemption. Very soon that land will be hard and impenetrable. And then again, when we blink, it's going to be soft. And the tiniest little shoots of life will grow up from it and grow and be vibrant. And again, there will be a bountiful harvest. And then the time to rest. The gospel story plays out all around us. There is so much good news and so much to be hopeful about when we choose to look and to see it. One of my favorite authors is Barbara Brown Taylor, and one of my favorite quotes from her is this, Earth is so thick with divine possibility that it is a wonder we can walk anywhere without cracking our shins on altars. Earth is so thick with divine possibility. It's a wonder we can walk anywhere without cracking our shins on altars. This quote reveals the reality that there is hope and there is possibility all around us. I want to tell you a little bit about the vacation we had because I learned some things there and I want to share it with you. We were going to a family wedding on the weekend but our anniversary was that Thursday so we spent three days in Pigeon Forge, Tennessee down the Smokies and we stayed at the Christmas Inn. Best decision I might have made in my entire life was booking our stay at the Christmas Inn. Immediately before even walking through the front doors, I was 10 years old again, and the magic of Christmas was palpable. I can easily be overcome by scents, but there was a very subtle, scent of cinnamon and fresh baked cookies when you walked in the door there was a fireplace and all kinds of decorations and when you checked in if it's your first time there they give you a christmas ornament how fun is that and then in the and it's kind of a small place they, it's not overrun then they in the bottom level they have this den kind of area guess who holds a concert there three times a week santa claus and all of the kids get to sit in the floor up front and right in the middle there and he sings Christmas songs and he talks to all of us and then they have homemade cookies and milk afterwards. I mean honestly does it get any better than that? I wouldn't even have had to have left the hotel to have had a wonderful vacation. 
Devin got to choose our adventure while we were gone. He chose zip lining. So we went out on this zip line and the treetop zip lining was closed. We did the mountaintop zip line. And you have about 20, 25 pounds of gear strapped on you. And that's good because it's solid metal that hooks onto things. And I was really thankful that it was metal and not some kind of plastic. But anyway, they drive you straight up the side of the mountain to this platform. And then you climb up to the top of this platform, which moves a little bit, by the way. And they've got a fence with a little gate. You're not allowed beyond that gate until they tell you to come beyond the gate. But first, they take your safety wire and clip it on. Then you're allowed beyond the gate and there's, you know, about this much platform there. And you gotta step up onto a box for them to hook you up on the line. I don't know why that box freaks me out so much, but I did not like standing on that box on that platform. Then once the catchers on the other end tell you that it's, they're ready for you, they unclip, that safety line and then it's up to you what person are you going to be are you going to be the person that comes back in are you going to be the person that just stands there and doesn't move or are you going to be the person that takes that step off the platform and it all came together for me in that moment. The joy in that Christmas Inn is available everywhere. It's easy to have there, but we get to choose who we are each day in our lives, just as we get to choose if we're going to be the person who steps off of that platform big hunk of life is choosing how we feel about it. Do we choose to be happy? Do we choose to see the hope all around us? Or do we choose to focus on the other stuff? There are so many grand stories of hope in our world. Google it sometime. You're gonna scroll for hours. And I love all of those stories. I love to hear about how Mother Teresa changed people's lives, not only in Calcutta, but all around the world. I love to read how the Fillmores started Habitat for Humanity and have changed millions of lives. I love to read how the folks at Bread for the World are feeding people, millions of people around the world. But to me, the biggest signs of hope are in the private struggles that each and every one of you have faced and leaned into and overcome in your lives. That's heroic to me. When the phone rings and everything changes and you don't let that knock you down or you don't let it keep you down. You stand up and you lean into those hard times and you prevail over them. That is so heroic. And to get to be a part of that is transformative. And then to watch you take what you have learned from all of those struggles and from overcoming all of that and to use all of that experience and wisdom and energy to come together and to share it with others who need that hope and that encouragement in their lives. To me, that's the biggest light in the darkness. Mother Teresa was asked many times, by people how they could change the world. She had a couple responses to that. One was draw your circle small. 
And she didn't mean that to draw your circle small to exclude people. What she meant by that is draw your circle small so that you can focus all of your love and your efforts truly on the people in that circle. And then she would also say, if you want to change the world, go home and love your family. It sounds so simple, but it's not always easy. And to take for granted and be less than our best for those people that we interact with all the time. But when we can figure out how to love people who are at their worst and who see and experience us when we are at our worst, when we can learn how to love that person and like them,
Is it Marge's birthday? <laughs> Brenda, can you sing happy birthday? Concerns? Are there any concerns to lift up? Let us pray. Merciful God, it's beyond our knowledge and understanding to put into words the wonders of your coming to be among us and all that it revealed to us and continues to reveal to us. We praise you for the light that came into the world at the birth of your Son a light that is still shining and showing your glory to us. Accept our worship that comes from hearts filled with awe and wonder. O oh God, as we prepare in these days to celebrate your birth, help us to not get distracted and overcome by things that point us away from you. Help us, O oh God, to put you at the center of all of our celebrations all of our days, all of our plans. And God, we pray for those in this world who experience the worst things. We also pray for those among our family and friends who need healing in their bodies, in their minds, and in their spirits. Hear us now as we pray. Holy God, Most High, you came into this world as light that shone in the darkness. Help us to also mirror your light so that others can see you in all of your glory and in all that you bring to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The operatory invitation this morning comes from Proverbs 3, 9. Honor the Lord with your substance and with the first fruits of all your produce. However you choose to share your gifts and offerings, know that in your giving you receive a blessing. As we come around this table today, I want to talk about Sam's Club. I enjoy my membership to Sam's Club. I really enjoy going to Sam's Club on a Friday afternoon. As you walk around collecting your groceries, you can find a little bit of a treat here or a little sample of what might be for dinner over here. And it's just a little bite, but it's really something what can happen with just a little bite, isn't it? And now we have an opportunity to come around the table this morning and have a little taste of what God has for us. A little bit of juice, a tiny wafer, and it's astounding what a little bit can do. A little bit of faith can move a mountain. A little bit of God can transform let's come around this table and share the gifts of God for the people of God.
Lord's Supper is open to all who acknowledge that Jesus the Christ as Lord. Both the nature and the action of Jesus become evident in communion. That God is present in our world through Jesus is what we find expressed in the bread and cup. There is a feeling and an emotional reaction to communion among Christ's followers that affirms God's real presence with us. But the broken bread and poured cup are not just an emotional experience. They are an experience in which we are reminded once again that we are brought together with God through Christ's actions on the cross. Followers of the Christ are invited to share the bread and the cup and feel his presence. And on the night when he was betrayed, he took a loaf of bread, he blessed it, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, and said, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, after supper, he took the cup and shared it with them, and said, This is the new covenant. Do this in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Shall we pray? Lord, you are the hope of the world, and as we come into your holy presence, hear our prayer for all who have great needs. Send us from this worship strengthened and ready for real living so that we are no longer afraid of life. Grant us power to overcome and faith to rise above life's disappointments and tragedies. Help us to be still and know that you are God. Deepen our spiritual lives and help us to grow closer to you. Bless this loaf and cup as we remember the supreme sacrifice that was made so that we may live with you in eternity. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Mm -hmm. in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Today, to change the world, to change the world with the love of God, with the love of God, the grace of Jesus Christ, the grace of Jesus Christ, and the courage of the Holy Spirit. 